One of the reasons why we scheduled Mike for the second day for kickoff is because we know that there are a lot of people really want to focus on their career, really want to focus on giving back to the community, but also sort of understand that, yes, there's a hiring process, but even more difficult than hiring is managing people in this space and helping them with their career development, helping them with their own issues as they battle going between technical and soft skills, how they they go through that evolution. And Mike gave a fabulous presentation last year. We cut him down to only 30 minutes last year, and I realized that that was a horrible mistake. So <laughs> I asked Mike if he would be willing to speak for a, long, a lot longer than 30 minutes. So we have him for about 45, 50 minutes. I do apologize that it's so hot in here. We try every year to get air conditioning in here, and it's just not going to work. So it's not you, it's the room. Please give a warm welcome to Mike Murray. All right, did I turn that on? Yeah. Good. You got it? Excellent. Thank you for such a fantastic intro. Um, I, this is my favorite talk to give. I love getting to talk about things that aren't the typical security conversation. And this one specifically is one that I've been wanting to do for a long time. I'm, as Kathleen said, I did 30 minutes last year, but I'm going to change it up a bit and talk about a few different things this year, as well as um, go a little deeper on some topics that we as security people and, and even we as managers don't think about that often. So I think I'm going to start in a different way than I'd planned. Um, I personally, and, and I've said this in other talks, but I personally think security is the hardest industry in the world to actually have a long-term career. And by extension, it makes managing security people the hardest place to manage. And especially as you go to the higher level of technical skill in security, the pen testers, the reverse engineers, the threat intel analysts, the people who are the, you know, the, the uber nerds of the uber nerds uh, in this, you know, at Hacker Summer Camp here, the difficulty in maintaining that becomes incredibly hard. And, and I don't actually think that, uh, I'm not just paying lip service, I can, I can back that up. If you think about where all the security issues are in the technology life cycle, all of the security issues are at the front, right? When a new technology comes out, it's got lots of vulnerabilities. When a technology's been around for 15 years, it has very few vulnerabilities. I'm old enough to remember the late 90s where there was a remote, um, remote root vulnerability in the main ISC bind DNS tree every single month. When was the last time that happened? Anybody even remember? 2011 maybe? 2010? Because at the beginning of the technology lifecycle, we have lots of vulns and we have lots of problems. And if you think about where we were 10 years ago, everyone was talking about, oh my goodness, social media security. If people can get access to Facebook at work, they're going to destroy the company. And there were all these things that popped up about blocking access to Facebook and Twitter and social media. If you walk the floor at Black Hat or if you walk the floor at RSA, that's not a product anymore because the industry evolves so fast and all the issues are at the front end of the technology lifecycle. Well, what does that mean if you're building a career? It means your skills are out of date every 36 months. That's not true in the rest of technology. If you were an Oracle DBA in the 90s, yeah, there's still stuff to learn. I actually, two of my best friends are PeopleSoft consultants. They learned PeopleSoft in like 2001 and their skills are all still relevant for people who still run PeopleSoft, right? Now they have to learn Workday, but you know, Oh wow, every 15 years you have to learn a new thing. With us, if you look at the talks this year at this conference and you look at the talks five years ago, they're completely different. And if you were great five years ago, you're useless today. That means every single one of us has to either reinvent or we wash out every 36 to 48 months. And if you're two cycles behind, you're unemployable. Do you know what it's like to manage a bunch of people who are so information crazed that they have to completely reinvent their skills every 36 months? It's insane. And 
to do career development and to keep those people happy and challenged and motivated as a manager has to is incredibly difficult. Now, couple that with the fact that most of us end up in security management by being security people. Let me ask you all a question. How many of you got into this because you like computers? How many of you got into this because you like people? Like, the, the four people at the back of the room. Wait, are you guys recruiters? Sure. <laughs> All right, point taken. Yeah. What? Ah, that's a different, that is an entirely different conversation. But when you're talking about moving into management, it's not about science or not science, it's about people. And in fact, if you just take a screenshot of the word hackers and the word managers on Google Images, you notice on the left hand side, it's all single people. And on the right hand side, it's all groups. And I, I resemble this remark. I am the biggest introverted nerd in the whole world. I would far rather be reading a book than talking to people, especially this week, like going to parties, not my thing. And I am now signed up to be in a job where 40 people literally talk to me all day, every day. And that's what you have to accept. The interesting thing is, we all think that because somewhere 100 years ago, when people were making factories, the career path went like this. You were on the assembly line, doing assembly line stuff. And then when you got good enough, you stepped back from the assembly line and you were a manager. And then you stepped back further and you were a manager of managers and soon enough you were the CEO. The only way to make more money was to get off the assembly line and stop doing work and become a manager. Luckily, that's changing. I would bet that any of the people around the outside of this room, um, and if you don't, you need to change this, have a career track for high skill individual contributors that are not managers. Um, even, a, I used to work at GE, the oldest of old companies. And they have a career track for people who are highly skilled workers who do not want to manage people. That wasn't true 20 years ago. And so when we were all growing up, everybody in this room grew up more than 20 years ago, I can, I'm pretty sure. When we were all growing up, we were all taught, my parents and my grandparents all had this to say repeatedly, you know, you have to go get a job and then move into management, right? You don't have to do that anymore. And I'm up here to tell you, being a manager sucks. It's really not all it's cracked up to be, unless you actually really want to do it. Now, here's a, here's a little insight into me, and here's, here is, to me, the reason to become a manager. Um, I was a smart technical person, relatively so. I could do more work than most. But I now have an organization of 40 some odd people. I can never be smart enough to get the kind of results I can get with 40 people. And for me, it's about doing bigger things, having bigger challenges, solving bigger problems, and I can't do that by myself. So I had to figure out how to do it through people. And ultimately what management is, is the act of getting results through people. Fundamentally, your job becomes, instead of I'm the smartest person who gets all these things done, I need to take 40 people and make them all smarter and make them better at getting things done than I am. That is fundamentally my job. And that is ultimately how your performance as a manager should be measured. If you haven't read Andy Grove's High Output Management, it is the, the sort of seminal Magna Carta on technological management in this era. It's, you have to read it. It's required reading if you ever want to manage. But the idea being that a manager is successful when two things happen. First, their organization performs well, and also, Everybody that relies on them performs well as well. Because we've all been in organizations where you see one manager who his organization does great, but everything else they touch goes just craters. That's a crappy manager. That's a manager who's not doing a good job. You know, as they, if, you, if anybody's a sports fan, they always talk about the really great players elevating the play of the people around them. That's what a really great manager does as well. Now, how do they do that? I mean, none of us came into this world 
with really good ability to figure out how to get results through other people. Frankly, it's not something we were ever taught. We all used to get in trouble if we would read each other's schoolwork, right? We used to get in trouble if we would solve problems together. But ultimately, that's what management is. Management is the ability to solve problems through other folks. Um, and fundamentally, the manager's currency is one thing. It's meetings. How many people hate meetings? You're doing it wrong. That's what I'm here to tell you. The rest of this talk is going to be almost exclusively about meetings. And that's because that's what managers do. Now, I'm not saying that it's all meetings, but in some way it is. If you write a document or you send a long email to explain something, all you're really doing is making that document a proxy for going and sitting down with the person you're sending it to and having a meeting, right? There are ways to skip the actual meeting part, but the acts are the same. And the acts are three things when you're doing management well. You have meetings that do three things. They transfer information. And that's where emails and documents and in the old days memos, conference calls and things like that come in. The second is decisions. And the third is influence. And we'll cover all of those. By the way, that is actually my calendar from last week. Um, I put some gray boxes on there because I didn't want you all to see exactly who I was meeting with or about what. But that's literally my calendar. And it's color coded. Red for strategic or tactical decisions that have to be made. Yellow for regular things, uh, regular meetings, my staff meeting, uh, iteration open, iteration close, stand-ups where we have or where I attend them. I don't attend all of our stand-ups, um, et cetera. Blue, one-on-ones with either my people, my direct reports, or uh, other people beneath them in the organization, skip levels, or other people you know, in my peers that I might need to have one-on-ones with. You'll notice there's a ton of one-on-ones on my calendar. And we'll come back to that later. And then green, the last thing, because as far as I'm concerned, no meeting is useful unless you're really prepped for it. Green is either somebody stuck something on my calendar ad hoc and I didn't get the chance to change the color, or um, it's blocks so that I can prep for other meetings. Really, my life is I'm either in a meeting or I'm prepping for one. Because that's where all things happen. That's where all decisions happen. That's where all information transfer happens. Now, uh, like I said, I can proxy that one. I can send information transfer through email if I want to. But often, it's easier to just stand. You know, I, I, can, I can spend two hours writing a long document, or I can walk into a room, have five minutes of conversation, and transfer the same amount of information. Or it's about influence and training. So you all hate meetings. The truth is, there's nothing more important than meetings if you're a manager. That's what you do. That is your currency in the world. And if you are having bad meetings, it's because you're doing it wrong. I'm not kidding. There's a great book by a guy named Lencioni called Death by Meeting. And in it, he says that all bad meetings come down to one of two things. Either you're unclear on the context of the meeting. And by context, I mean, is the meeting a decision-making meeting? Is the meeting for you to transfer information? And I really hope it's not most of the time. Or is it for you to influence or train? And often, you will have meetings that are just sort of all three. You know, the senior VP walks into the room, spends 15 minutes kind of rambling about something that they think you should know, and then says, all right, let's make a decision on that. That's a crappy meeting. The truth is, a really good meeting has a solid set context. You know exactly why you're there. And then it has something else. Everyone hates meetings. No one hates movies. Why are movies interesting? What's the fundamental core thing that makes a movie interesting? Not popcorn. I'll, even if I bring popcorn to bad meetings, it's still a bad meeting. What? In a movie? What do you mean? Well, it is one way, but that's not what makes it good. Go. What makes a good story? Okay. 
Ben Stiller, no. <laughs> the fundamental thing that makes all stories a story is conflict. It is man versus themselves, if you've ever studied storytelling, man versus themselves, man versus nature, man versus other. There is always conflict in a movie, even if it's only the inner conflict of one character. A, a movie that has no conflict is not a useful, um, is not a useful movie, or an interesting movie at the very least. Certainly not a blockbuster. My staff will tell you, none of them are here, amazingly. Um, they've all seen this. My staff will tell you that my staff meetings almost always devolve to conflict. I've recently let them in as I was giving them this presentation on the secret to that. My staff meetings always have conflict because I make it that way. If we're making a decision and everyone walks into the room and completely agrees without saying anything, why are we having the meeting? Waste of time. If I'm gonna say, okay, should we invest in this or that? And everybody already knew the answer? I shouldn't have asked the question. I didn't need to. I certainly didn't need to waste everybody's time having a meeting about it or sending an email or whatever. So if I'm asking that question, somebody in the room disagrees with somebody else. It's my job to make sure that that comes out in the meeting. And I will tell you, when people start to debate, everyone listens. No one gets bored when there's actually a debate going on in a, in a meeting. It's only when someone's droning on for 30 minutes about something that you already knew for like the last two years that everybody tunes out, right? So a good meeting always has conflict, unless it's an information transfer meeting. How many of you, you folks do agile and have stand-ups? How many of your stand-ups drone on for more than 15 minutes? <laughs> Pretty much all the same hands. The problem with information transfer meetings is we tend to go to them and just let somebody talk forever. Information good stand-ups should be five to 10 minutes tops, and if it's really bad, 15. Unless you've got like 100 people in the room, in which case, why are you having a stand-up with that many people? But if you have five people, if they can't quickly say, here's what I'm working on today and be done, you're doing it wrong. And so you end up with one person droning on for five or 10 minutes of your five or 10 minute meeting, and the other people are all checked out. Because there's no conflict, because all they're doing is saying what they're doing that day. Now, this doesn't count the rare case where there's actually a conflict, and actually something has to be decided, and actually something has to happen, in which case it's not really a stand-up anymore. It started as a stand-up, and it became a decision-making meeting. The only other time you really want to use meetings to transfer information are like this meeting. I could have written this as a book, but most of you wouldn't have read it. And it would have taken me months to write it as a book. I can give this presentation in, what did you say, I have 45 minutes? I can give this presentation in 45 minutes, and it serves itself well to interaction, to questions, which I will take a ton of, um, to me interacting with you guys, in a way that if I had written this all out, um, it would have wasted all of our times collectively. You know, this is 45 minutes of your life. If I write it as a book, first of all, it takes me months to do it, and then it takes you a week to read it. So sometimes information can be transferred very effectively. If I were doing a detailed technical spec, I probably wouldn't do it as a PowerPoint presentation up in front of a room, right? A detailed technical spec, writing makes more sense. All right, decision making. How many of you are good at making decisions through other people? other than me. Yeah? Not very many of you. Which makes sense. Most people weren't trained to make decisions, right? Most people were trained to make their own decisions. And this is fundamentally what a manager is there to do. Beyond transferring information to people and keeping everyone up to date on status, the fundamental thing that we all are supposed to do is help our organization change, pivot, move, get things done which requires decisions. And if you stop making decisions, all activity in the organization stops. Just think about it. If nobody made a decision today, we wouldn't do anything. You all made a decision to be here instead of the I am the cavalry track, right? That, that is how things happen. And if you stop making decisions, things stop. But if you're not good at getting a team of seven people to make a decision with you, as a manager, you're probably not doing it very well. So the, 
I'm not going to go into this in too much detail. There's a really great blog entry that I linked at the bottom of that. And I assume we're going to share slides? Good. Um, so uh, you can, I'm, I'm going to transfer that information through the slides, and you all can read it later. But basically what it comes down to is when you're making a decision, you have to know how the decision is going to be made before you try and make it. That sounds like a really obvious statement, but far too often we don't do that. How many of you guys, when you walk into a meeting, you say, all right, here's how we're making this decision. This person's making the decision. I'm making the decision. Or we all have to agree before we make the decision. If you don't know that, and half the room thinks everybody has to agree, and one person thinks the decision is all theirs, that's where you get a really messy organization and bad things happening. That's where we, that's the bad side of office politics, when we do a terrible job of actually figuring out who's making a decision and how so everybody's unhappy about it. And if you do that, most of the other stuff is easy. Present the, present the arguments on both sides, have conflict, come to the end of the conflict, and when you get there, resolve it, make the decision however you said you were going to at the beginning, and move on. The last one, and this one's my favorite one, because this is the one we do terribly badly. Andy Grove in um, High Output Management said, training is the boss's job. And it fundamentally is. And we do, as an industry, a terrible job of training our people. We send them off to here. We send them to a course and think that that's what training is. But fundamentally, on a day-to-day -day basis, as a manager, your job is to make sure your people are equipped with the tools to do their job. And that means understanding one thing. When you're training somebody, what, what results are you trying to get? Well, positive. <laughs> yes, positive generally. Well, actually, no, you could, you could be training them negatively. Right? If you're training a puppy not to pee on the rug, that's negative reinforcement. Right? The answer was encoded in there somewhere. What are you trying to get when you train something? Outcome. Specific outcome. Define that outcome. Outcome how? What is the outcome in all cases? Behavior. behavior. It's a change in behavior. All right, master class. What's a behavior? It's a conditioned response. I, I, I'll, go, I'll go along with that. Were you a psych major? Um, I actually personally like B.J. Fogg's model of what a behavior is. He says a behavior is a response you get when you have sufficient motivation, sufficient ability, and you're reminded or triggered at that moment. That's what a behavior is. That could be an example of the puppy not peeing on the rug earlier. That could be... Um, knowing how to respond to a particular alert in an IDS, that could be convincing myself to go for a run even though I'm tired. Or go to bed early. I have to have sufficient motivation, which that's the one we all focus on. There's lots of motivational speakers in the world. But most of the time, when you're not, making a dis when you're not doing a behavior, it's actually because you don't have the ability. And we don't spend enough time thinking about ability. An ability is not just skill or capability, it's also time, right? We, we all make lots of, we all fail to do lots of behaviors because of what is perceived lack of time. It's cognitive resources at the time. Sometimes I'm just stressed out and I don't respond the way that I would potentially like to or are motivated to. Um, it could be money, it could be any, anything that limits your behavior. And so if you think about that, your job as a manager or a leader is fundamentally to spend your time ensuring your people have motivation, ensuring they have ability, and reminding them to do things at the point where they have motivation or ability. It was really funny. Um, one, of my, one of my leaders actually has a monthly report that he does. And we were talking about this, I was talking with somebody else about this slide yesterday, and he was sitting next to me, and he said, that's why you email this, me the second Tuesday of every month and ask me where the report is. You're triggering me. I was like, yeah, that's exactly what I'm doing. Because I know that by the second Tuesday of every month, you probably have the ability to have written the report already. 
I hope you're motivated to have done it. If you're not, I've got a bigger problem. And so I remind. I think of my job in terms of influence as spending my time increasing people's motivation, increasing their ability to get their jobs done, however that is, and reminding them at the time. And the most important place to do this is a weekly one-on-one. -on -one. I have weekly one-on-ones with everyone who reports to me, and unless I'm on an airplane or the CEO calls a meeting, I make those meetings as much as I can. Um, because that is where you get to assess motivation, that's where you get to assess ability, and that's where you get to trigger. How many of your managers have every week a one-on-one -on -one with you? Half the room, not even. 30% of the room? That's terrible. That's, what? It's scheduled, but they don't show up. So uh, there's another great book on management called Behind Closed Doors, uh, written by Esther Derby and, and Johanna Rothman. And I took some of the things on this slide from that. Um, that, to me, I don't know. How do you feel when they cancel all, like when it's canceled every week? You feel like they care? I mean, to me, that's a sign that, like, if I was canceling a meeting with an employee every week, I would, I would actually have to ask myself why I hate that person. Because that's probably actually why. I've had people like that. I and mean, we've all, anybody who's managed for a while has had the employee they really don't want to deal with. Look, we're all, we're all humans. I'm a human. There are some people I just don't want to deal with. If I find myself wanting to cancel their one-on-one -on -one every week, that tells me I have a much bigger problem and I should probably figure out how to address that. Yeah. Slow them down, yes. Um, but I don't think that there's ever an organization that slows down by having better connectivity between managers and their people. And truly, for me, that meeting is for them, not for me. So the agenda, the things that, that we want to talk about, unless I actually have something that I want to shift from a motivation or ability perspective, um, that weekly one-on-one -on -one is their opportunity to talk about whatever's on their mind. And if they're not, if they, go ahead. Potentially, it's just hard to keep, I find it, and, and other people I've talked to, it's hard to keep a rhythm that way. You know, if I talk, just imagine if you only talk to your girlfriend every two weeks, Great. right? <laughs> Great. <laughs> <laughs> you, you get the idea, though. Like, there's a, there's a frequency and a regularity thing that is, that's important. Yeah. See, if that's the case, then I can, I can hear that. I just never run out of things to talk to them about. You know, if I, if I don't think there's going to be a topic, I'll often, I mean, every one of my people has things that they, either they want to work on, right, for their own careers. Um, I have a couple of people who are relatively new managers. And so even things, like two weeks ago, we had one of those. I said, all right, what's on your list? And he said, nothing. And I said, OK, let's talk about the structure of your one-on-ones with your people. I always have a, a list in my head of things that I can bring to that meeting. But, uh, and, and I've yet to run out um, of things that, that either I want them to work on or they've told me they want to work on, that we can use that 30 minutes or, or in, in a couple of cases where, especially as someone joins my org, I'll have, I'll have weekly one hours for, for the first few months. Because there's a lot to teach, right? There's a lot to even, even just, you know, here's this person, here's how to interact with this person better. Or, you know, have you talked to this person about this other thing? I'm struggling not to use real examples. Um, but I have yet to run out of, of content for those one-on-ones where I want to make the organization better. Yeah, go. Uh, you've already mentioned mm. strategy. Yeah. I mean, strategic things that the scope doesn't change each week. Like, if I want to have that strategy where you want to be in three years, if it changes week to week, I'm firing you. 
Well, no, it shouldn't. So, so I'm going to try and recap some of this conversation for the for the video. It, it, it shouldn't. Your strategy shouldn't change week to week, but if you can communicate your entire strategic vision for three years for that employee in 30 minutes one time, I I think you're aiming too low, right? Like I, I have so much to talk about and to teach, um, and to get from here to three years, I could probably do an hour a week and not run out of content. Make sense? Well, except that, what, what do you mean when you say three-year strategy, right? I'm not talking about three-year business strategy. I'm talking about, you know, yeah, who do you need to be? I, if, if, I can't spend, um, if I can't spend 52 hours a year helping them become who they want to be, I'm, you know, th that's my job, right? Go ahead. I don't, I don't have directs for 40 people, okay. right? Okay. I have an organization. There's a, there's a scaling issue, too, because if you, you basically fill your, your entire week with one-on-ones or you know, stand-ups and things like that, there's, there's less of your time to spend on your knowledge, your skills, and, and sure. your ability to manage where you don't have that time left, it seems like, you're just looking at that schedule. Yeah, well, no, I absolutely, I absolutely have that time left. That's all the strategic decision meetings were not one-on-ones, right? There, there's a lot of content. There's a lot of time spent. And, and by the way, I don't work just nine to five either, right? So there's time outside that calendar that I'm doing prep work and other, you know, other stuff. But you brought up a really important point, which is span of control. Right? Nobody can directly manage 22 people effectively. Because you're, you're never going to really understand the three-year strategic goals and, and how you're interacting with them at a level where you can actually have significant influence. If you're trying to do 22 one-on-ones a week and track all of those people's growth and all of those people's evolution in your head, you're just not. Right? So um, to me, uh, if I'm over about seven direct reports, uh, I, my head starts to swim. And you know, that's, to me, I've heard people say three to seven. I've had good managers who had as many as 10, but that generally is the more senior levels. You know, as you get farther down the org, um, really being hands-on managing more than, more than seven to 10 people starts to get crazy. Like, you're right. You, all you would do is handle one-on-ones and growth, or what really usually happens is you just ignore all of that. Right, and you spend your time doing strategic and tactical work, and those people see you a lot and interact with you on a surface level, but you don't know anything about them, like on a deep, like actually connected level. You, I, I realize as I'm talking, like what I said at the beginning is really important. I really spend a lot of time trying to actually work with people and the people in my work. Um, and I think you're doing a disservice if you're not. Um, when I think about how you actually get results through people, it's through the people. And if you don't like people, right, and, and I had to come to this learning. Like I, by the way, I didn't learn any of this naturally. I really am an introvert. I actually don't do this easily. Um, I am much better sitting with a book than I am with, with people just in terms of my natural disposition. But I realized when I went into management, if I wanted to get results through the organization of 40 people, I actually had to invest the time and energy to learn how those people worked and to learn exactly how to get those behaviors on a week-to-week, -week, month to month year-to-year -year basis. Um, in the same way that I invested all that time learning you know, how Nmap works and uh, how to write shell code and uh, you know, the the difference between a buffer overflow and a format stringing bug. Like I, I invested the same amount of learning time in learning how the people work as I do in learning how the technology works. Right? It, it's, if you're, and this is why I started out by saying management sucks. Right? If, you're not, if you're not willing to do that, it's like the technical person who's not willing to read technical books, not willing to invest in technical books. How good at technology are they going to be? They're going to suck at their job. Right? And, and far too often, we have managers and we think that the most technical person is suddenly going to be the best manager because they know all the technical stuff. It's useful from a training perspective, 
But if they're not willing to put in this effort, and by the way, as an early manager, I, wasn't, I didn't know this, and I was a crappy manager. If you went back and talked to the people that reported to me back then, I was kind of shitty at my job. And I, I've worked really hard to hopefully not be nearly as bad at it anymore. But uh, yeah. Yes, somehow. Yeah, um, and you say you don't want to accept the direct. Yeah. Um, and then you said that people don't always look good managers, and I totally agree with that. So how do you find the people that you think would be the least that can take over a subsection of your team so that you, you reduce the, the people that report to you? Like so the question, just so, so for the video, was basically how do you select, I've got a group of techn technologists from whom I have to promote a manager somehow, how do I pick the manager out of that group? Is that, or lead or whatever, yeah. Basically, how do I pick the person that's gonna do this? It's the person whose eyes didn't glaze over when I started talking about meetings. And I'm not kidding, like, if you wanna nerd out about, that, like, this, tr the people who show up to this track and are like, there's a talk later about office politics. I, and my first thought was, oh, I wanna see that. That's the person that should be the manager, is the person who, wants to go to that talk instead of a, a technical talk at the same time. Be, and they self-select. You know, the, the, I have one, one guy on my team, fantastic technologist, but he's always the first one to ask me about a people question before he asks me about a technical question. And I have other fantastic technologists on my team that have never talked to me about people at all, right? And so, it's really back to that first slide. It's back to, do you want to just work on technology by yourself? Or is what really interests you like, oh, how did that person make that person do what they wanted? Um, you know, I went and learned hypnosis at one point so that I could be a better manager. <laughs> yes. Um, it, but, that, but I self-selected on that. That was something I, nobody told me to do that. I was just like, oh, I bet this would be useful for me. Are you referring to like creating some kind of social currency between your employees and you during the one-on-one? -on -one? Or is that just... Well, you definitely do. You definitely create that social currency. I mean, not just keeping it on a technical level, but actually getting to know the person a little bit to get them to do your bidding. Yeah, well, <laughs> actually, I just want to know the people that work for me, too. I, you know, I'm, I'm Canadian, so I'm nice by, by nature, right? It's, it's built into my genetics. And... And so I, my first thing is, like, I do want to know them, you know? I, I actually want to know what makes each of them tick. Like, I, I want to know what makes them happy when they show up at work, because I like making people happy. And, and so, yeah, there is social currency to that, and it eventually translates into influence, but part of it's just I like it. You'll be able to keep your turnover numbers a lot lower as well. I hope so, right? And, but actually, so hang on. something. He just said something really important. He said that, that that'll help me keep my, my attrition and turnover numbers low. In some cases, I actually don't want that, right? I only have a certain number of roles for people that I can, you know, I'm, I'm not gonna promote 40 people into management. There's times that I've actually said, hey, let me help you go outside the organization because it's better for you, or, or you should take that job because that job's better than what you're gonna do here. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not a slave to turnover numbers. I'm actually more, should be obvious, I'm focused on what makes them happy and what makes them grow, because I figure this industry is really small. Like, I can't walk 10 feet out there at this point. This is, we were talking about it yesterday, this is my 16th black hat. Um, it's 16th year here in Vegas in the summer. And I can't walk 10 feet without somebody I worked, you know, that worked for me, that worked with me, that I worked for at some point. And many of them I've worked with, or they've worked for me or whatever, more than once. So doing the right thing today, maybe it's hard today, but it, two years from now, it might be the best thing I ever did. As a manager, um, what degree do you find yourself assigning accountability within your own organization? Do your people step up and take accountability themselves, or is you as a manager have to delegate that? Hmm. I think it, it's really situational. Um, I don't think it's as simple as that because in a lot of situations, especially the work we do, it's, it's a threat intel group, right? There's a lot of self-motivated people. You know, people who show up for DEF CON on a weekend because they want to, I don't have to assign very much accountability. Now there's other situations, especially with younger um, employees or in different, different situations where you can make that happen, but I'm lucky. 
right? I work in the kind of organization where people kind of self-select to do stuff like this, which means a lot of them just do it naturally, right? It just happens. Um, excuse me, and I, I actually, uh, yeah, I count myself very lucky to have people like that. Um, I, I think part of it is I'm like that too, right? It, it, like I said, 16th time here, I'm, I pretty much like this industry and I pretty much love what I do. So I, I think that that probably impacts how I put people around me. I like to have people that are excited to come to work every day and love their jobs. What happened to the microphone? Oh. What do you feel about uh, technical managers? In other words, those that aren't necessarily wanting to be the CEO someday, but yet want to stay technical and yet be at the, it, have a little bit more say in what they're doing. In other oh, absolutely. Words, there's, I mean, there's, there's a lot of us out there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm not the CEO. Um, I, I happen to be a business nerd too, and and like the you know like starting companies. I started a company many years ago and really enjoyed it. Um, but I've been a technical manager all my life. Yeah, I don't, I, I don't buy that whole, yeah, I don't buy that. I mean, y you, if, if I have a person who's really great at what they, you, you know, the Peter Principle, the idea, and the Peter Principle is always said as this really cynical thing. Like, the, for those who don't know, the Peter Principle is the idea that everyone gets, eventually gets promoted to the level of their own incompetence. And it's actually a very profound thing. It's not cynical. In the, and it's exactly what you're talking about. What we tend to do is we take someone who's really great at a job and say, hey, you're fantastic at this. Go do something else. I got a, I got a promotion for you. I'm going to take you out of the job that you love and you're happy and everything's awesome, and I'm going to make you do something you didn't, you didn't ask for. That's not really a great idea, right? If you find somebody that's super happy and doesn't want to move and doesn't want to change and just kills it at what they're doing, why would you change that? Right? But, but you're right, we have an industry-wide thing of like, okay, you're, you're a senior manager, you should be gunning for director, you should, be, you should be learning to manage managers. Some people like managing people who are doing work rather than managing managers who are managing people who are doing work. And it's a different skill set. Right? It's a different skill set to manage engineers than it is to manage managers. And we don't give that enough, uh, we don't give that enough play in our industry. Well, actually, I was going to ask my uh, second question first, which actually ties into that, because yep. I'm in a situation right now where I'm um, managing somebody who was promoted to manage a technical team, but won't extract themselves from doing the day to day because he's lost the trust of some of the people that he's managing. Mm -hmm. So that's a challenge, which is to basically tell them to kind of cut or fish bait. How have you have you run into that and have you manage that? <laughs> Can, have you, uh, how do you avoid that? That's you can't. That's that is that is the ultimate situation where. He asked the right question earlier. That person doesn't really want to invest in managing and in invest in the trust, right? They're, they're falling back to their technical skills because that's what they know. If that person really was eager to manage rather than eager to just get stuff done, they'd be learning this stuff rather than focusing on the technical work. Um, in that situation, you gotta, you got to make a determination. Does that person really want to manage? And a lot of the time, the answer is no. They were thrust into that. They were the best technical person. They were given this, and now they, they're not very good at their job. And that might be the case. You might just have the wrong person in the role. Now, if they actually, you know, if you sit them down and say, look, do you really want to manage? Then you have to, I, I joked at one point about taking away someone's commit access, right? Take away the person's commit access. Or basically just say, look, you're not allowed to do this anymore. You have to figure out how to work through your people. And I don't care if you miss this deadline. You, by the way, this is going to be a hard one on you because you're going to have to let them fall on their face. If they really want to manage, you have to let them fail so that they learn how to manage. And, and if you're not able to let them fail, then you got to figure out how you're going to play that because clearly they're falling back to committing code and you know, solving the problem themselves because they don't know how to get their people to do it. And you, something's got to give there. Is that? Amy? Yeah, that sounds good. Um, if you want to chat like for real afterwards, yeah, I do. grab me. But uh, the other one was, um, 
So at least in security arena, you mentioned you got people that are motivated due to the mission or whatever they're doing. Mm -hmm. There's some other cases where you're trying to get, trying to instill motivation in other people. What have has been kind of like the little trick there to kind of that nudge to kind of like see their value and get them to kind of to get to the next step. I'm. <sighs> This is a really, by the way, this is where we're going to have conflict in the room. Um, I'm about to say something really unpopular. I don't think you can genuinely, I genuinely don't think you can motivate other people. Um, I think if you have to instill motivation, you know, like the beatings will, con will continue until morale improves. I think if you have to instill motivation, the person's in the wrong job. And, and, if, and it could just be that they're demotivated because of something. And if you've evaluated, okay, why is this person not motivated? Well, they hate the person they work next to. OK, I can solve that. I can move their desk. Fine, great. But if they're not motivated because they're just miserable and not motivated, they're in the wrong job. Like, period, end of story. And all of your efforts are ultimately just going to be small pieces of scotch tape on a very large problem. And you're, you're, going, to, you're going to let them go, or they're going to quit a year from now. Hurry up. Or, ret or retire. <laughs> right. Um, so early on, you mentioned the high rate of skill set obsolescence in the field. Yeah. Um, and you also mentioned that it's you know the boss's job to make sure that the people are trained. Yeah. So how do you sort of reconcile or get buy-in on the idea that people sort of might need to be trained, you know, not for the thing they're doing right now, but something for one year, three year, five years down the road? You know, maybe if it's not directly applicable to the company's current sort of mission or or contract. Well, so we were talking about this. This, this is that. This is like how you fill a one-on-one, -on -one, right? Um, if you see that something's going to change, right? If you see that their skill set, they need a skill set three years from now, and, and you can see around that corner, um, break it into bite-sized chunks and figure out how to feed it to them very small pieces at a time, and figure out how to lead them there over the course of the next three years. That's uh, the. Slow, steady. You're not just going to send them to a training course and be done with it. Like, this is going to be a development path. You got to know what the development path is for each of those people. What are you going to say? How do you convince your management that that training path is the right path so that you can get financial approval to send them to that training? Oh, I'm not usually sending them anywhere. Uh, I mean, I'm not usually. I mean, if you're doing it as if you're doing it, you know, piece by piece, send them a blog entry a week. You know, this is what I mean by piece by piece. If I, don't, if I know they need a skill three years from now, I'm not going to send them to a 40-hour boot camp for it. Right? I'm going to put that 40 hours over three years, in which case it's probably not the kind of investment you're thinking of. Now, there's some situations where that's, that investment happens. I talk through the development of all my folks with my manager, always. Right? And you know, I actually just got a new manager recently, so I haven't started this with her yet. But it's my natural thing to, at least once a month, in my one-on-ones, talk through if I'm having issues with these. Like, my boss got there because they're a good manager, right? generally. And if they didn't, I probably have the wrong boss, and I'm probably at the wrong place. Um, but generally, my boss got there because the, and the, my new boss is phenomenal, phenomenal manager. I have zero qualms asking her, every, like, OK, I'm thinking this person needs to learn x over the next three years. What do you think? Here's my plan. Got any ideas? And then I don't have to get buy-in. It's their idea. Right? They, they've bought in just by talking to me about it. And whatever, we come, whatever decision we come to, I'm then going to go action because we've already decided. Right? Back to meetings and decisions. Right? Um, it, it becomes a decision at that point. And, and I don't have to work for buy-in because they've participated. We... So you got one more question? All right, one more. Ryan. This is a little bit different. Um, I, I've struggled to identify um, candidates that are coming from IT, like mid-level or junior level positions, into entry-level security positions. They're not understanding that security isn't this, I call it this sexy thing. It's kind of boring and tedious, and, and it just is not as exciting as people lead it up to believe. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've hired people that seem like good IT firefighters that know the technology and can learn. And they come into a security role and they just suck. So I'm curious what your techniques are to kind of prove somebody out uh, entry level positions. Security is a mindset. Security is, yeah. All right. When you guys walk into a casino, how many of you see where the cameras are? Look around the room. It has nothing to do with skill. You find the person who sees that and they'll learn the skills. And you find the person. 
I, I, my ex-wife, we would walk through a casino, she would never know where a camera was. Most people, most normal human beings, by the way, we're not normal. <laughs> normal human beings don't know where the cameras are. That's the problem you're having. You're taking people who don't see things like that, who don't look at a system and inherently go, I could mess that up, like everybody in this room. If you're taking people with the wrong mindset that don't just naturally, and I, I don't think you can teach it. I really don't. I think, like, there's a reason we come to this conference and we all come voluntarily, right? We pay to be here. Like, the folks who pay to be here on weekends, you know, in the middle of summer when kids are on vacation, I, I can take anybody in this room and I can turn them into a great security person because you can all learn the skills. You have to have that, that um, mindset, that way of looking at the world, and, and you just have to learn to select for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, motivation's a big deal, right? You have, to, you, you have to want it. You really have to want it. All right, I'm going to get kicked off the stage here. Um, but feel free to grab me. I, this, is, this is one of the things I nerd out about, so I love talking about this. So thank you all for listening. Thank you, Mike.